Welcome back to another episode of Meet Unshackled. Which camera am I on? That one over there? Yeah, we have a studio audience. Uh, we have Destiny, Larissa, and Eric. You can't hear them right now. But this is a special, <laughs> special. You, you have a mic yet, Eric? All right, we're going to have a mic for our producer so we can ask some questions because I can't. Sometimes I'll leave things out. But this is an incredible episode of Meet Unshackled because we're going to talk about the history of Arizona cannabis. We're going to talk about where it came from. I know a lot. I've been around for a while, but one of the first people I met in Arizona cannabis in 2012, who has was here long before I, is uh, Butch. How are you doing, Butch? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Butch, you are a legend for a lot of reasons. And uh -huh. I, I don't know where to begin, but first, I mean, you're, you're most well known for because if people Google your name, They'll see the White Mountain Health versus... The state of Arizona. The state yeah. of Arizona. So I like to explain the journey to legalize cannabis is not done yet. It's like crossing a river that's six inches deep and it's boulder after boulder every two feet. And it's a long river that you got to cross. And there's certain steps. Shout out to the Steve Foxes, to Ethan Nadelman's, the Chris Cranes, the Rob oh, Campias. Yeah. Forefront. For all those people mm -hmm. that helped with the initiatives and taking steps forward. But then when we got legalized, uh, we, the, the initiative passed in 2010, and I'll let you take over here in a second. Uh, there was your case. Yeah. You know, so let, let's go back to November 2010. Uh, the initiative passed. I imagine you were part of the team that was working on the initiative. But what happened after the initiative passed? Well, honestly, I was living in Oakland. Okay. And... Um, my father had recently passed in 09 and I had just graduated and was a chiropractor and I was actually in the industry in Oakland. And um, California OG. Yeah, I was one of the, I was a, a caregiver for Angel Rach, who, who was one of the first federally recognized patients as well. So caregivers are the good guys. So I got I got known for that and did a lot of high time stuff and did a lot in the Bay Area and got known for that. But uh, as soon as it passed here in Arizona, because I'm an Arizona native. I knew I had to come back here and um, and help. So we packed up literally and moved back to Arizona because I was going to get a dispensary and I was going to help move this movement that uh, I saw in the Bay Area. And uh, that's exactly what I set out to do. And I didn't know that I was going to be um, called to do what I did but because uh, I didn't ask for that. I didn't want to sue. I didn't want to be sued. And I didn't... But I did want to be a big part of the movement and help uh, establish the like, foothold here. You're one of the OGs, and all the, I always like to say the legacy guys, the OGs, are like the true freedom fighters. I always use that Dune Muad'Dib, the spice, who, he who owns the spice controls the universe kind of metaphor. We don't need to get into that. But you were a freedom fighter who was called to take your turn on the front lines. Yeah, yeah. Right? You were... Um, you I started out bringing uh, ASA here, Americans for Safe Access, mm -hmm. and um, joined forces with Normal, with uh, with Lori and Eric. Um, Shout out to Keith Stroop and the yeah, Normal people. Yeah, there's... Uh, we've... we've So Normal became the, the grassroots, and we started really pushing um, the movement because we had a lot of backlash. It barely passed here, and there was a lot of still people on the fence on if it really worked, um, if it was a medicine. And so we really started trying to hold uh, meetings and put the, uh, you know, basically the word out there by marching down to the Capitol. And, and, and they, did, they did start to see us, you know, eventually started to see us and started putting things together in action. And uh, shout out to Andrew Myers, of course. Um, now, this is a time in 2011, 2012, where, you know, we still had, we didn't have Colorado yet. Mm -mm. So I remember I was working at the city, city for the city council down in Tucson, yeah. and we were trying to figure out an ordinance to regulate time, place, and manner zoning. And I'll never forget, and I learned from this. I had city attorneys, city prosecutors, uh, uh, all kinds of council people, and we're all pulling shit out of thin air. Yeah. Like trying to create, like, oh, this is what's happening in California. This is what the ordinance should look like. There weren't even dispensaries. No. The licensing process wasn't even determined yet. Mm -mm. And we have this government group creating laws for something they know nothing about. Yes. It was, it was, we, I, honestly, we weren't even reflecting on our own ignorance. 
No, that's we, how crazy. So we had to, we had to start really talking. You guys knew, we didn't know. We had to start talking to people. We had to start setting stuff in place. And the first thing to set up in place was the caregiver program here, which worked really well in California, which I knew very well in California. So I brought some of my knowledge there and was able to start helping others um, because dispensaries weren't open. And so caregivers, there was that weird, weird gray area where you can grow your own and get permission from the Department of Health to grow your own, and so people were. And then there was these weird, you know, people that were taking it even further, and um, like the the markets that were showing up, you know, oh, the, yeah, farmers the farmers markets. markets yeah. The, and I don't know if we should call out, but she's been through a, a whole bunch. But Rain Baker was one of those main. Her proponents for that, and she really pushed the the envelope and got a more people noticing. And if it wasn't for her... I don't think she can get in trouble at this point. <laughs> no, and I think that if it wasn't for her putting her neck out there, um, that it really forced the state to, to, to see the need for dispensaries, to see the need for them to put that into action, for them to put laws into to place. And that's where I decided to step up and to really work on getting that place. <laughs> and so you applied for a license in May of May through mm -hmm. the application was due in May of 2012, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. How many licenses did you how what was your process? I, I applied for several areas, mm -hmm. you know, Fountain Hills up in even up in White Mountain areas down to uh, Sun City. Um, the old Chaw process, Google it, mm -hmm. community health analysis area. And nobody really wanted to mess with Sun City. <laughs> Because it's a county island, yes. and county islands are governed really by the county. And at that time, we had one of the strictest uh, county prosecutors, Bill Montgomery. I don't know if I should be bringing up another war, but no, uh, it is yeah. what it is. The truth, yeah, he, the truth he, will always set you free. And so, what happened is he he would not sign over my rights to have permission to have my location there. So I didn't get my city permit or ordinance because there is no city, so I, I couldn't get a, a right sign off on it. So I submitted my application without it. <laughs> right, and part of the package that you had to submit between May, I don't know what the deadline, I think the deadline was May of 2012. Yes, yep. Had to have all these da -da 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 boxes was... checked, and one of them was... The approval from the jurisdiction that you're going to operate in. My jurisdiction was told by Bill Montgomery not to sign anything that I turned in and that they will all be in jeopardy of being prosecuted, that I'm in jeopardy of being prosecuted, and that um, he'll see me in court. And then, but nobody else applied in that chaw? Nobody else wanted to apply in that chaw because they couldn't. Uh, they didn't want to fear that, put, right. put, you know, they couldn't get that out and then... So I decided to sue. I said, well, it's my right. That is a chaw that was in there. I got denied by the Department of Health, so I sued the Department of Health Services as well and said, you know what? We're going to sue you because you're supposed to give us this, and you made the rules. The state said that they were supposed to have this, and they aren't following the rules by signing this area, which follows the rules. So we went to court, and we battled, and we the state, as soon as we beat the state, they signed over and gave us our license. So we were in a, in possession of a license, right? but we were still not authorized to open up anywhere. And during that time... When did, what, do you remember the month and day that you won? Must have been a celebratory moment. I know that we op opened... But when the judge issued the ruling or where were you kind of thing? I, I do, I do so remember. 2012, I was, 2013? I was sitting in my, in my home and I had just gotten through doing the Shema and meditating. And, and I just really had opened up my, I just felt it. I knew right as I was done, I opened up my email and I read the Judge uh, Gordon's case saying that we won. And I remember it was cold outside around October, if I remember right. Yeah. I mean, it was... Was it, so I think it was 2012, 2013. 2013. 13, okay, yeah. yeah. And that's why some people were upset because they thought that that court case could throw out all the licenses that they were issued. Well, at this very, as soon as my lawsuit went into place, the department basically wasn't, everybody basically was scared to open because of this, the simple prosecution. Um, because Bill Montgomery said that they will prosecute anybody. Mm -hmm. And that opens their doors. And 
Um, I think he looked at me as I was going to be the first uh, that he was going to, and he was going to make an example of me. And um, to be honest, it was very intimidating, and I got intimidated by a lot of the people in the industry because they wanted to open their doors and they thought that my lawsuit can hurt them. But they had no one, they had no idea that yeah, no it was if it wasn't me, it was going to be them. That it was a federal preemption thing that he was trying to get that 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 our laws he wanted to get the law completely abolished because he said it's preempted by the federal courts. Yeah, by and, yeah. And, that, and at that point, I was I got drug into a federal instead of me trying to just sue for my license, he drug me into a federal uh, um, lawsuit. Right, and again, my I was in a partnership with a partner who had passed away. So I had to build another team behind me. I was in my 20s at the time and um, very naive. Um, I, I feel like I'm an, an intellect, but there's a lot that comes with age. Yeah. And I found that out now. It really is. And uh, I was very naive, but I think I, my naivety really helped push me through thinking that I can get this done and I'm going to win. I had zero, there was zero option in my mind that I wasn't going to win. Even with all the threats, even with everybody putting it down on me, I knew in my heart I was doing the right thing, and I was going to win this lawsuit, yeah. period. And we did. <laughs> that, that, that's awesome. And so it was like 2013. So when, do was, when did you open up? So we ended up opening um, December of 2013, and we opened our doors, which we did immediately um, under – because of our, our lawyers, our lawyer says, listen, now that you have permission to open, you need to open. You need to get things going. You need to make your first transaction so you cannot be stopped again. So it will be harder for the, the lawyer, for them to come and stop you because now you have all the licensing. You've got all the permission. So we did. We took a, our first transaction that evening and um, we became officially open and we've been open ever since. And it's day. been White Mountain Health White Center. Mountain Health Center in Sun City, and we've been the first out in that area, and um, there's quite a few around us, and we welcome all of our competitors because we know we have uh, what it takes to uh, treat our customers well, and we've been able to hang in the game. We're one of only the few um, mom and pops I'm still available. I'm told there's eight individually opened <laughs> dispensaries, uh, yeah. owned dispensaries, mom and pops, but, you know, there's two mo- – Sets of two, sets of three. They're mom and pop too. Yeah, but yeah. Your so your ten year anniversary is in December. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, nice. It'll be ten years. That's gonna be a party. Yeah. Wait, no. <laughs> uh, wait. Yeah. Okay. December. Yeah. It will be December, and we we were we were later than some because as soon as we won the 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 lawsuit and we got our license, a lot of other uh, brave souls opened their dispensaries and just started dis- doing. And so they were grateful, but I was still in the mud because we kept having to go through this federal and I stepped going, I couldn't get all of the licensing until I was done with getting beat up by Bill Montgomery, Tom Horn. And at the, at the time it was Jan Brewer. So I really had all three of the top prosecutors here, um, down my throat and, uh, literally threatened me and my family. I've, I have children and, 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 uh, with, with prosecution, with, being raided with, and I, I had zero to do with anything. So, <laughs> it was like, I'm yeah, just... I'm, I'm clean. I didn't, wasn't involved. I was just a voice and applying and trying to, um, you know, make a, make a difference. And I, I didn't ask for it, but I am grateful that I got put into that position in my naivety and my, I think that my pride at a young age um, kept me fighting. Yeah. Um, because at this point, it would be very hard for me to um, to accept what was in front of me. Because looking back, that was a really hard, hard thing to go through and to put my family through. It was, Do you have like a book or have you written a book on this? No. A short but I story? Have, I definitely have journaled every day of my life. You journaled it? Yes, I have. Well, there you, you, oh, yeah. you That journaling is a good idea. <laughs> yes, I, I should have. journal too. Uh, have you done other podcasts on this subject? Um, I've done another po- a couple other ones, um, yeah, but I kind of kept, I kind of kept it because I was so bitter towards how I was treated. I kind of kept it quiet a little bit. You yeah, know, it went from the zero to hero, and then people were proud of me, but I kind of felt fake. I kind of felt it was fake because they weren't very happy. They weren't very nice to me in the in the process, but became. But I have some fans. 
that have been supportive of me throughout the whole process. I shouldn't say everybody was was yeah. cruel to me. Like you, my friend, was one of them that I, had I didn't know what to me. make of the whole situation. I'm, I mean, so you, like you just kind of stood there and really kind of listened and, and took it all in. And yeah. I, I've had even like Steve Shapiro. I want to give him a shout out, and he's another dispensary owner out here for uh, Superior Organics. He he was the first one to donate to my to my funds to 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 sue, you know, and. Um, uh, Steve White, you know, Steve, I want to give... Steve White recently retired from True Leave, I believe, and he's the one that had, that was my attorney, <laughs> you know, and the ACLU came on board and and supported me. So I had a ACLU lot. was on your side. They, I had they were my attorneys that helped me fight this fight and believed in me. So and 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 my beautiful late wife who had passed away six years ago, but uh, um, she was my biggest support, my yeah. biggest fan. When I sat there and told her I'm messing up. This family, look at us. We're, I'm, I might go to jail. She looked me dead in the face and says, this is going to go well. You're going to get this done, and you're a warrior. You're going to have this. Is yeah. She stood by me. What you kind of there, woman? Bro. Just, that's, that's beautiful. That's really. And I would never have done it without that support, so I appreciate all those people. Man. Um, without mentioning any names, uh, what, what were they angry about concept-wise, uh, some of the haters, some of the angry people? I mean, except not the Bill Montgomery's and those, but there were some people within our industry that were mad at you. And I, I forgot exactly what the – do you want to talk about that for a second? Well, when, when you had to apply for a license, you had to have your facility ready, and you had to have a location. And so there was a lot of money vested into getting the facilities and paying. These people were paying <laughs> rents for a year or if not longer – because of my lawsuit. They also had put in a lot of money vested to get the license. And so they were awarded these licenses. And if I lost this lawsuit, right. they lost their license. They Everybody lost the license. Not just me in this state. Right. But across all the other states that are passing federally. So right. my lawsuit, that because I beat federal preemption, had opened the doors for every other state to not have to fear the state's going to um, come. I mean, the federal uh, regulatories are going to come in and, and bust down their doors. So that really did open it up nationwide. So this lawsuit was a bigger one than just Arizona. So because of that, people from outside the states were looking at me as like, you better not mess this up. You, young man, better not mess <laughs> this up. And, and it was a lot more aggressive than just you young man yeah because <laughs> i was a young idiot no and, and that's fantastic and that was an unexpected wonderful result uh in regards to the federal aspect of it yeah. you were just trying to get your doors open um but it, i do like people to recognize who watch this podcast there's different types of, of cats <laughs> in this industry there's people that just look out for their own selfish financial interests and there's people that are a little bit more concerned about the community the development of a cannabis community access to the plant, the meaning. I, I like to be involved in the philosophy of cannabis. I found the, the, the spirit of freedom is what gets me excited. Mm. You know, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. It was just uh, tons of people fighting for, uh, for freedom. And as Adam Smith says, there's only one real revolution, and that's the revolution for freedom. Yes. And it takes many forms over time. And it will always take many forms over time. It just, it's just it's eternal and ongoing. But I like to recognize... You and, 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 and others in this industry who are not just seeing things as widgets, you know, as how can I make money here, but who are also involved in the advocacy aspect mm -hmm. of it. And, and, and you have bridged both because you have a successful venture. Yeah. And, and I'm very grateful for the support that we've had behind it. Um, we've got a lot of grassroots people. Um, we support the seniors out there in Sun City, um, which a lot of people were curious why i did that but i i recognized that they were the ones they were the true original grassroots our baby boomers that came through and support them um and you're like 20 percent medical out there still right yeah yeah we we really because i i truly understand the value of the, the the medicinal value of the plant right now we're in a culture now to where it's more recognized and accepted to be used as a recreational drug um it's still giving them so many value, so many medicinal values and benefits that they have no under, maybe they will never understand. Right. But and that's okay because they're still using it. And I think that the collective consciousness of us as human beings are going to be more um, better off with it 
um, because we're more passive, we're more understanding, we're more clear-minded when it comes to, and I think the, the, the stigma of stoners don't, are lazy stoners. Stoners are what really move this country to actually change. The stoners are really ones, the movement of the hippies that really um, see the, the value of love, to see the value of helping others without it. And I know that dispensary owners and dispensaries are getting bad raps for being more of a commercialized product. Uh, and I hope to, to, that White Mountain will never be able to, to say that. Um, like I said, we're one of the few that will stay um, for the people. You know, we're a, we're a, I'm a patient. My dad died of cancer. Um, it's White Mountain Health Center. He's buried right up there in the White Mountains. That's uh, part of the story behind the name. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. I didn't. I, White Mountain Health is named after my father. Lives. He's uh, he's buried and born and raised in Heber, Arizona. Okay. And so you are um, a true native. You've I'm got a very. Station. I'm a fourth generation native on my dad's side of the family, and uh, my boys are fifth generation natives. Fifth generation. Yeah, my it's almost oh, yeah, un, yeah. it's almost unheard of to to have that, and I have those roots. That's what brought me back to Arizona. That's what's kept me here. I've been educated about this industry outside of here in in uh, California with some of the biggest and best and was blessed to bring it back here. Um, and I do feel like I've I've left a pretty neat little footprint here in Arizona, which is cool to, cool for me. No, you have. And, and you know, I mean, we know each other pretty well. And, and you have that perspective that I have found and I've come to appreciate the cannabis industry. I came into the cannabis industry in 2012 looking at you know, it's a it's a business and economic mm-hmm. opportunity working for my brother, um, understanding regulations, licensing rules, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Three years of cannabis university, 2012, 2015, doing a little business over here with my brother. I came to understand the world was different yeah. than the world I was educated in. <laughs> yeah. And and I understood the truth. And there's so many stories I haven't told you, like all the friends from law school in the nineties that would come to me in 2012, 2015, like, hey, Downing, we know what you're doing. We were high during last law school, but we didn't tell you. I'm like, really? I'm like, why do you think we got such good grades? Yep. And I'm like, you bastards, I got C's. You guys got A's. Yeah. You guys were smoking pot the whole time because it helped you focus. Yeah, it does. I'm like, that's like a valuable drug, you know, valuable medicine. And uh, and then people would talk to me about sleeping and how it helped them sleep in 2012, 13, 14. The Bake Bros guys, when I met them and I tried their They're syrup, the OGs down here for their uh, yeah. their edibles. Yeah, and the Bake Bro guys, I'm like, wow, this is going to replace NyQuil one day, and it's yeah. natural. Yep. You know, I'm like, I'm like, well, Nancy Reagan, what the hell were you teaching me? But I don't just blame her. It was Democrats. It was Republicans. It was doctors. It was media. It was politicians. It was democracies. It was mm-hmm. kingdoms. It was dictatorships. It oh, was yeah. apartheid. What was South Africa? Oh yeah, it was all. It was all. Everyone. Yeah, it, and, and and because the agenda was to um, dull and dumbify, and to to be honest, to make people more stressed, to break break ourselves. Because if there's fighting within ourselves, even especially if it, it the real war is within our home. We can get that stress, you know, and drinking was the, the okay to do because that's how you all got to unwind. You know, they put us in these situations where we work really hard, and especially in the United States where we work, 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 and then we go and unwind. Right. And uh, alcohol is a disconnect. And alcohol can and can literally change you, but marijuana is something that actually put, put people together, brings a community together, and they saw that. They saw that with the migrant workers. They saw that with the jazz music. They saw that with these communities of love and, and, and health, and they, they were jealous and wanted to get rid of this, and, then, and they saw that the you know, DuPont industry was very opposed to the, the, the uses of... Cause, I mean, cannabis alone, just the hemp alone, and so many textile properties to it. And um, newspapers at the time were wanting to just shred up trees. And, you know, it's it, 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 there's a lot of, like you said, the politics and stuff yeah. that goes behind it. I, I absolutely agree with you. I want to talk a little bit about you as a practitioner and all the other modalities, because that's yeah. another important thing I learned from the cannabis industry. And you guys led me there. And so I appreciate that so much. Just real quickly, I don't know why it happened, DuPont agenda i can't prove any of that there's a lot of like speculations but what i can prove is stupidity yeah and ignorance and stupidity is no excuse for a government action exactly and 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 that is definitely the case they just had it all wrong Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> i.e. COVID. Um, so <laughs> COVID policy. And I won't bring that up, but uh, but I want to talk to you about because another huge theme in the cannabis industry, which Arizona is learning about, which people are learning about and have been for 10 years, part of the bigger movement, is the availability of, of cannabis as a natural remedy. But there's other natural remedies. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of stuff. Like, talk a little bit about yourself and, you know, how you're a chiropractor and some of the other modalities that are out there that you understand and believe in and support. Well, yeah, I had my history is just brief with with um, Materia Medica, you know, and chiropractic therapy because uh, my my real love was growing marijuana. That's what put me through school pretty much in California was growing marijuana for my own benefit. I uh, suffered from rheumatoid arthritis, which I no longer suffer for from, ironically. Um, but yeah, that's what put me into this whole process. And um, there are so many uniquely different uh, properties in different plants. Like the flaxseed alone has can cannabinoids. CBD is one of them. So there's other cannabinoids in other plants. There's cannabinoids in, within our bodies. You know, women produce breast milk. The, uh, I think it's called anatomide, something like that. Just it's a hard word to, produce, pr to pronounce, but it's a endocannabinoid. So women produce breast milk. And in there are endocannabinoids, which are the exact same molecules as the THC molecules, CBD molecules. You've got these molecules that women are producing for their children. Now, why is that important? Well, you've got the endocannabinoid system within our bodies that have the CB1, CB2 receptors. And so if it's important for mother's milk to be producing it, and it's important for us to be ingesting it, if we have a receptor for this, we need to really start investigating that. I never, ever learned anything about the endocannabinoid system in any medical classes that I've ever taken in anything. And it's one of the most profound, most prolific systems that we have in our system. It's what I believe jumpstarts the immune system. When mothers feed their babies, they're finally giving those endocannabinoids assess it, uh, it, to be able to start the digestive system, the immune system. It helps them sleep. You talk about the babies getting milk drunk from their mother's milk. Well, that's the cannabinoids inside there, relaxing the body, creating neuroprotectants within that baby's brain as it's starting to develop. Up. So we need to start investigating these other plants that have these introducing those into our system. Well, you got me wanting to go buy a pint of breast milk here. I'm yeah. like, this is this stuff sounds good. It's quite delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I didn't <laughs> Sorry, you got me on a rant. Yeah, no, and I apologize. No, no, it's, it's, uh, there's there, there's butch breast milk. <laughs> yeah, the mountain butch there. breast milk. You here. can find it at Whole Foods. Yes. <laughs> Can, <laughs> yeah. can, can you find any ladies out there that are ready to supplement? No, just kidding. No, no. no uh, can you, do they sell bush breast milk? You do. They do actually. So you can go on, and there's lots of women no out there doubt. that actually will give their extra supply. They'll sell it, but there's a lot of like issues that come along with that. You've got to understand that the person you got to know the person you get it from because breast milk is a way for it to transmit from the mother, right? So whatever the mother's ingesting, you're going to ingest that as well. So all the good stuff that's inside breast milk's great, but anything that mother's taking, it could even be pharmaceutical drugs. You got to can't just buy breast milk. That's why it's right. kind of illegal for it to just be out there being sold. Is it? I, I think is, you could is, be donated. Is it technically illegal? I think so. I've I never bought it myself. That, that could be um, a, our next project. Yeah, we'll talk about the, 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 <laughs> We're legalizing old. breast milk. Le yeah, legalize it. But we should, we should, should you should be very cautious on who you're getting it from, know what yes. they're eating, because that's what you're going to be eating. Yeah, I, uh, this, this is a great topic. <laughs> but I was trying to lead to not just breast milk, whether it's chiropractic, how do you, chiropractic? Chiropractic. Practic, uh, or other modalities. Mm -hmm. You know, the cannabis movement again is about uh, educating people and, and and making people aware that there's naturopathic, homeopathic, mm -hmm. all sorts of remedies out there in all sorts of cultures throughout the entire world that should be explored. And we shouldn't just have like a doctor pill prescription. Well, and that's what like, we're battling you know what right now. Where we're, I work really close with uh, Dr. Sue Sicily with the Scottsdale Research Institute. And I um, mean, that one, we've got permission to work with uh, psilocybin. Psilocybin. And um, we're really we're really going on with a handful of other uh, psychedelics that we're in the process of. So wait, wait, 
for the news and announcement of that. But we're starting to see that there's what what Sue has explained, and I don't want to speak for her, but what, what we've seen is that we've seen the, the the people that we're using the cannabis for for the PTSD and other stuff. That they've also have stated interest in um, psilocybin mushroom um, benefits and. So we've been granted permission to study and work with that. And that's just in its very infantile stages. Uh, but it's something that I think we need to take very serious. I think that we need to start seeing um, um, or actually starting to, to have patients be more vocal uh, about their um, desires to use psychedelics in their medical use and in their mental health. Um, it's, it should be at least discussed with their their primary care doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists. They need to start um, having this as an actual modality for patients to to use. Um, I mentioned that I had uh, lost my wife, and I did lose my wife to mental health. Um, so this is a, a factor for me that I am going to fight for a long time to see if we can start um, not just with cannabis, but with other modalities of natural plant and fight the standards um, that they have now of using just one specific chemical or one specific uh, molecule within the plant and using more of a holistic approach, taking the advantage of the whole plant Mother Nature has given to us and understanding the reasons of why it has like its whole symbiotic relationship with our body and what each step does, you know, that's what we should be studying. No, absolutely. And, and, and the human experience and the human health and the human health care systems are much so much more complicated than like I, I was raised in the 80s and I bought into the life in the 90s. You know, you go to a doctor, you get a pill. I wasn't doing yoga. Yeah. And so the cannabis, some of the cannabis industry yeah. movement people said, Dimitri, you know, those who were concerned more about the movement and the cause and the concepts rather than the money said, Dimitri, you should try yoga. I'm like 40 years old yeah. trying yoga for the first time. Now I do yoga every single day. You can't I, live without it, right? I was dead before yoga. Yeah, I know. I was, I, I mean, talk about being comfortable in your own skin. Silly, silly. I feel the same way. And I had a friend that did the same thing and I made fun of him for a long time until I finally got low enough to my own self-worth to where I'm like, I better do something. And I did. I started doing yoga, and I can't do. I have to do it every day. And, and, and yoga, cannabis, psilocybin, these are all modalities that are designed and, and made available and created by God, some divine inspiration. I don't know. Who, wherever it came from, doesn't matter. But they're here for us to use in a responsible, disciplined way to improve ourselves. Absolutely. And, and this is like a concept that, like... I, I think it's just kind of maybe just got forgotten or something. I mean, that might have been an agenda. It is an agenda. The distraction is an agenda. You know, when you can distract us, or when you put your where you put your your focus is where you put your energy, and they want to focus us every which way yeah. instead of within. And that's what we really start needing to do. And these plant medicines, we're starting to discover that and see that we need to get back to nature, connect with nature, ground ourselves. Just literally putting our feet in the ground. You've been to my house, if you go out in that grass and we've put our feet in that ground, you ground for a good 15 minutes, you feel different. You're charged, you're battery. We are batteries. I did discover at Butch's house <laughs> that he has the ultimate sack. I do. I <laughs> it's, it's very, you know, house. I'll recognize a man who has the ultimate sack all day long. No, no, no. It, it is... <laughs> It's a bean bag. <laughs> it is a bean bag. Yeah. It's, and by the way, Google Ultimate Sack. If, the, yeah. if there's one thing I can share with you from this is try modalities, shop at White Mountain Health, check out the Ultimate Sack. Yeah. <laughs> get out of yourself. Get out of yourself and get over yourself. No, but yeah, you do some great sound healing too. Yeah. Sound I didn't healing. even know sound healing existed. Yes. We should have kindergartners across America learning about sound healing. That's right. Yoga should be part of every PE curriculum. That's, yep. You know, and and and, and your meditation. Right, meditation, right? We're we we are not teaching our kids to quiet the mind, and it's not necessarily we need to quiet their mind. We need to let them get in control of the mind. That's different. See, people want to meditate. They go, "I'm gonna. I can't think of anything." No, my friend, it's being in control of what you're meditating on, whether it's the breath, whether it's the uh, a, a mandala or whatever you want to say. It's controlling the mind. That's what meditation Absolutely. is. Absolutely, and sometimes, sometimes you need a substance to control or uncontrol, or, or to, to introduce disconnect. how to. Yeah, and whether it's cannabis or LSD or 
alcohol, I'll get, okay, alcohol's a medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fine. Um, you know, that, that should be available. I say fermented accessible. drink because it's alive, but uh, like, like beer, wine, those things fermented, that's, I think, healthy for meditation because you're drinking something that's alive. Yeah. But if it's pure alcohol, I say, rec I recommend don't do that. They call it spirits for a reason. I'm not trying to go super existential on everybody. No, no, but go. They, they call it spirits for a reason. You're taking the essence away from it and you're take you're just drinking the alcohol part. The essence is the actual life part. And they, you know, it's like drink it's like eating cold cannabis, you know. You want the whole cannabis plant. You don't right. want to just like everybody's dabbing the, the diamonds, you know. It's not the same effect and it doesn't do the same for you. So you want the essence of all of it. In my opinion. No, you're not you're not wrong. And, so if you're and, gonna meditate with alcohol, yeah. use it life. Use it use it. <laughs> I'm still learning myself, which is another cool thing yeah. for me in the cannabis industry. I mean, ten years I am learning more every single day. Yeah. Um no no, it's been fantastic. I was gonna say something for a couple of Yeah, oh yeah. I cannot believe one thing. Oh yeah, my producer's telling us we're he's we awesome, could, by we the could way. go on talking all day. And I encourage you to to reach out to Butch and go by White Mountain Health. I'm sure he's there most of the time. But <laughs> Uh, it, I just wanted to make a comment. I cannot believe what the alcohol industry has gotten away with. I know. Over the last hundred years, mm -hmm. taking something that was used as a medicine and appropriately, mm -hmm. recreationally here and there, back in the 1900s. Now we have a culture. Who's picking up the beer for the birthday party? Who's picking up the beer for the wedding? Yeah. For the tailgate? For the funeral? For the graduation, who's bringing the alcohol? Yep. Oh, we're at a restaurant. Here's half a card of food, and the other half is alcohol. Your drink is just as expensive it, as your meal, and it, you're willing to buy four yes. of those drinks. And no one reflects on this. It's wild. No, I walk into every single restaurant, restaurant yeah. where we're supposed to get food, and there's a wall of drugs yeah. that's more dangerous. Uh, yeah. Any drug can be dangerous if used inappropriately, but that's just promoted. And encouraged, and you're like, you want a glass of wine, you want a glass of beer. It's like, you know, they're pushing alcohol on us all I, the time. I know. I've been on a date with a beautiful girl, and we ended. We go in happy, and she'll have a few drinks, and then I'll be getting yelled at by the end of the night. Yeah. I don't well, know when it, the alcohol does something. That might have more to do with you than I'm could saying. be. Nah. Could be. Yeah. What'd you do? What'd you do? I was. You got to make sure you're drinking wine. Wine or if, beer. If you're going on a date with a girl, if she's a beer drinker. It's not good. If she does too many shots, not good. Yeah. Wine is like disappointing. If she doesn't like plants, also, that's a, a red flag, guys. I'm yes. just saying. If she doesn't like plants, if she doesn't understand plants, she doesn't understand self. That's it. But you should write. Well, we're gonna work on something. <laughs> this is this this conversation has just got jump started again and it's ongoing. And we're both of the mind, both same of the mindset, same mindset. You're far more knowledgeable than I am. Nah. But we're both heading in that direction. You know, and uh, which is which is absolutely fantastic. Um, let's talk real quickly about Bong Butch Tool because people have been seeing that logo and saying that's not White what Mountain. What is this? Health. Not White Mountain. That is my own and tool. It's got over 420 different uses. Um, it was nominated for the High Times Product of the Year, I think, in 2012 or something like that. Maybe 2010. I don't remember. But I love it. You love it. We love it. It's, it was my um, my business card. That's how it got invented. I just invented it as a business card, passed it out to everybody, and then... And, and how do people find out about that? Um, go to bongbutchtool.com or go to bongbutch on Instagram and hit me up. I'll uh, Anybody that hits me up from this podcast will get a free bongbutch tool. I'll mail it oh, out Oh, we got to put that on the LinkedIn. Watch the podcast, get mm -hmm. a free bongbutch tool. Yep. Uh, that's fantastic. Thank you. We appreciate that. Yep. I should get a free one, too. I'll uh, give. A, I'll put a bundle in here too for everybody to pass out. So. I appreciate that. And how do people get a hold of you? What's the best way to find you? You don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll put on the the caption. You will never meet this man. Watch the podcast. <laughs> uh, Bong Butch Tool. Uh, I'm just on Instagram. That's basically where you find me. Um, if you're cool, friend request me. If you're not cool, don't. On Facebook. Yeah. On okay. Instagram. I don't do Facebook oh, as much yeah. because I, my kids said that that's an old thing to do, and I'm looking pretty young these days. So. You are a young man, bro. You're like 40 years old. You got I am. I'm 40 big, years old. You are 40? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, so. You got a full head of hair. You're rocking and rolling. I'm trying. I'm still yeah. short, though. And we could... It's still short. Yeah, it's oh, good. good. They told you milk would make you stronger, but it didn't. 
Well, I, I know you've been through some. <laughs> Wait, is that the breast milk? <laughs> I was. I, I was supplemented, yes. obviously. Yes, we might have to get him a bottle of breast milk. Yeah. I'm gonna find Any that. volunteers? I'm saying, just uh, send first, me your daily regimen, what you eat. The first thing I'm gonna do when I get out, out of here is go Google breast milk and see where I can order some. Hell yeah! But how are you gonna prove that it's real and tested? I don't know. Uh, whatever. Uh, that, we don't need. I don't like testing. Um, but yeah, so we appreciate you being here. I'm so you come honored back to have been here anytime. And we're gonna continue doing things together. And I look forward to seeing where your journey takes you. We're both gonna be around, I think, for another 10, 20, 30 years. A lot longer. And see what happens. Oh yeah. You know, and uh, but thank you for joining us on Media Unshackled. Thank you guys. And uh, Destiny and Larissa and Eric and the audience here, you can't hear from them. We need to get our audience members mics. What's our playout music? Born in the USA. <laughs> <That's right. Boom. laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we've had a lot of trouble with music and stuff. Oh, okay. Well, I'll sing the say it. I'll make our own. Uh, Mita, we were rocking with Mita. We're rocking, rocking, rolling with Mita. That's right. He's a musician, com. too. <laughs> no, you are a musician. I've been to his house. There's music and instruments everywhere. No, Butch, thank you so thank much you for guys, joining us. This has been another episode of Meet Unshackled. Ah, thanks, guys. That was, that was